Um, welcome everyone. My name is Brian Matias. Uh, this is Lightroom Everywhere Live, episode five. Uh, and I, I love, one, I love having these live streams because, because like, for example, here we have uh, Richard saying that he's joining uh, in California while eating lunch, which is just a wonderful way to, to spend your lunch looking at, at this mug. But uh, we've got uh, Sheila from Canada. We have Susanna from Sweden. And then actually, this is very appropriate for my wonderful guest today. We have people from United Kingdom here, Leslie. Uh, and then I saw also Andrew from Nottingham. So listen, I, I already referred to a guest. Uh, why don't we, why don't we bring him before I do? Let me, let me just preface who my guest is. His name is Glenn Dewis. Uh, let's just get that out there. Glenn is a, is a good friend of mine and, um, just a, a wonderful photographer, wonderful educator, best-selling author, and really is one of those people in this space, in our space of photography, who, um, is doing a lot to push photography, not just traditional, you know, camera photography, but also mobile photography forward. And that's kind of how today's topic came to be, because what you're going to see now over the next, however, 45 minutes to an hour is almost uh, the, the basic conversations that Glenn and I have all the time in private. And so it's just a cool opportunity to bring him in. And so that's what I'd like to do now. Uh, Mr. Dewis, welcome. <laughs> Hello, Brian. How are you? <laughs> I, am, I am well. Um, how are you? I'm good, mate. I'm really good. What time is it now? It's uh, eight o'clock UK time. So I can see there's a few people from the UK uh, here as well. But yeah, good. Good. This is an hour away from my bedtime. Oh, okay. We we will we will be careful. Not really. Because no, I not no, really. Because I, <laughs> I get grumpy. I get grumpy if I don't get my sleep. So I, you will be happy to know, Glenn, that there is someone who appreciates um, just the amount of work where you have arms the size of stovepipes. So you you, know, mwah, mwah, you have to kiss the guns. Um, so Glenn, want, I, I gave a brief intro about who you are, but. I always feel like we're always best suited to, to tell people about ourselves. So just tell people a little bit about yourself. Uh, portrait photographer. That's, that is my main thing. I started out in the industry. I've lost count how many years ago now, but that was in the Photoshop world kind of things. And that's kind of what I kind of made my, I guess you could say made a bit of a name for myself with the Photoshop um but it got to a stage with the photoshop that i didn't want to be just known for it so after i'd released my first book i kind of drew a line in the sand and said right from now on i want i want to ensure that i have longevity in the industry so that's when i kind of picked up the camera and started to kind of run with it and i very quickly found that that seemed to be it seemed to be a really good fit for me you know doing the photography and doing the retouching together seeing the whole thing from start to finish uh, and having tried loads of different genres, uh, again, I very quickly discovered that portraits is my thing. And I initially started out doing physique portraits because that's very much a, a comfort zone for me. Having come from the, the bodybuilding kind of world, competitive bodybuilding thing, it was very easy to do that stuff. Um, but now it's more a case of character portraits, you know, trying to get that real person's portrait out. But yeah, like you said, I've written books. Um, very heavily involved in like, the education side of things, although I do take on the occasional photography commission, but I'm kind of in a position where I can be very choosy about what it is that I, that I take on. So when you, I mean, one of the things I've always, when I first kind of became aware of your work, the thing that struck me most is, of course, you've got the composition uh, side of things with how you capture a person. You, you've always had this very distinct way of doing that, but even more so, and I would argue one of the most elusive things for photographers is you, you've also developed a very distinct style in the way you edit your photos. Like I can see a Glenn Dewis photo. Like I can tell where there's Good. Th that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so can you, I know I, I, we have stuff to talk about, but this is also something that almost kind of like fanboying. Cause I, I genuinely believe one of the hallmarks of a 
the, uh, the pinnacle of a photographer is where mm. someone can go and say, I know that's your photo. Um, yeah. So and, and well, for you to say that, Brian, is kind of music to my ears because that was always the goal because, um, you know, each and every one of us, we, we spend a lot of time and we might not admit to how much money we spend on kit, but we spend a lot of money on kit. So the very last thing that you want is for when you're out taking pictures of whatever they are, you don't want them to be like the next person. You want to have, there's, there has to be something about them that says that they are yours. Um, so this was something that I was really kind of uh, determined and intrigued about when I first kind of started out. And I remember one of the best bits of advice I was ever given was from Joel Grimes. And Joel said to me to have a project and when you have a project, make sure you'd have at least 20 images in that project, because by the time you've done it, whatever it is that project entails, so let's say if it was a, a portrait shoot that you were doing a one light setup, you do that one light setup 20 times again and again and again. So that becomes very comfortable and very second nature to you. But what also happens without you realizing it is that your style starts to come out. Now, you can't force a style. This is what something I used to talk about a lot before. You can't force it to happen. It naturally happens, but it'll only naturally happen when you're out continually doing it over and over. But also, and this, this is like the thing that used to get a real sharp intake of breath when I'd explain that this is what I would suggest people do is, is to try to copy. You know, you find photographers whose work you really like, like me, I, I love, you know, Annie Leibovitz, Mark Seliger, people like that. And I would try to replicate their stuff. But even, but, and this is, this is the great thing about it is because we're all different. You know, we've all got, we've all had different upbringings. We've got different likes, tastes, dislikes, and so on and so forth. All that influences us. So when we do try to copy something, there's something that stops you doing it exact. Your own taste comes into it. It's like, I mean, I know you've, you, you know, you've done in-person kind of workshop type of things. And you might say to somebody, you might, you might give a room of people the very same file to work on that you're working on. And you'll say to them, right, okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to take this slider and we'll take that to 20 and this one here down to about 15. And I guarantee you amongst those people there, they'll be going, actually, I prefer taking it to 10. I'm going to take it to 10. Right. It's just something that's within you. It's your own personal thing. And that's what happens when you copy. You know, you'll, you'll try to replicate a look, but you'll start to steer off a different way. And eventually by doing lots of it, that's when people start to say, that looks like, you know, ex photographer, but something different about it. That's, and then, you know, the more you do it, it seems to be, it, your style starts to come from that. So I'm, I'm a big believer in copying, although it does seem to be, you know, very frowned upon in the industry or certainly used to be anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that there's a, well, there's also the old, the old kind of adage of like good artists copy, great artists steal, but the, the, there is, you have to learn at it's in some way like in my opinion i found that one of the reasons why i love presets is it allows me to kind of get an idea in in one click of of what these the snapshot of these edits do to this photo and yeah. yeah there does need to be a little bit of a curious nature in the individual to go and like all right well what happens if i move this over here and, and then you kind of start to adapt to to what your own kind of personal aesthetic is um mm. and so yeah i mean i i i appreciate that like i think that's such an important just piece of information that people need to keep in mind uh one the importance of kind of de developing your own personal style and two the method of achieving that because it's easy to say but mm. I do want to get into kind of the topic here because we've discussed this a lot, you and I, mm. in terms of the future of mobile photography. And I know that you and I are both very bullish about it. Like we're very excited about where it's going. So to start, what I would like to know is currently you talked about kit. What is your current kit? Like when you go out, what do you, uh, what do you pack in your bag? Um, what do you rely on and um, why? Now, are we talking mobile? Are we talking just normal, normal camera at the moment? <sighs> I guess both because both because what I want to know is at what point also that's where I kind of want to get to is like, where do you say, okay, I'm going to leave 
my camera behind because I'm confident enough that what I want to do, I can do with my, with my iPhone. So for now, let's just start with both. Okay. Well, I can give a very, very simple answer to this because what I've found, and, and you know, like I said, we've talked about this a lot, the kind of things that I'm doing with my mobile and also what I've tested to see if it's possible to do with my mobile compared to what I do ordinarily with my main camera. So it's kind of got into the situation now is, or, or the state of play now for me rather is, if I'm going to be doing a portrait, and I'm hopefully about to show you some of this in a short while, if I'm going to do a portrait, then hands down, it's got to be my main camera. It just would be. We're not, we're not at the position yet, however good the technology is, we're not at the position yet where my mobile phone, my iPhone can match the quality of what I get from my main camera. It, it just can't. However, there's a time when I would only take, I say, this is actually going to change soon as well. <laughs> the, uh, there is a time when I would ordinarily only take my mobile phone is when I would do something that I'm not known for and something I've only been doing for a few years. And that's the seascape stuff, the landscape stuff. Because mm -hmm. I only started doing that purely because of the COVID pandemic when I couldn't have, I couldn't photograph people. So I needed to do something that would keep the gray matter going. So I started to do seascapes. You know, fortunate living near the coast. I was going out with my main kit and which was my, my main camera and my bag on my back. I looked like I was in the paratroopers going on some kind of mission. Do you know what I mean? I had so much kit. And I found that that kit I had gave me too much choice. And it killed the excitement oh, and the fun of being out with my main camera. Um, so then Very I started to use my mobile phone and things changed because it became enjoyable. It didn't, there was nothing to lug around that kind of detracted from what I was there for. It was just pleasant. It was, and I was getting some great results that I was happy with for the, what I was using them for, for mainly for me and for sharing on social media. Um, so That's really yeah, interesting. It's, it's two very, two very different scenarios. So you found having versatility in, ha well, it's interesting because versatility comes at a cost when we're talking about a regular camera, meaning, yeah, mm -hmm. you can take your camera, but the versatility requires you to carry three or four, not very lightweight lenses as well. Um, mm -hmm. So you're saying, if I understand correct, correctly, you found kind of a, a certain creative freedom in well, let me ask you, do you feel that there's a limitation to when you go out with to do seascape or landscape photography just with your iPhone? Do you know, I, I don't find there is a, for the kind of stuff I'm doing at the moment, or I've been doing the majority of, I don't find for me at the moment there is a limitation because the fact that it, the fact that there is so only so much you can do with it means that I don't have a limitation in a way because I know that that's what I can do. So I can't, I don't feel as if, oh, I'm missing out on doing this. And I'm also not somebody who's massively experienced in the great scheme of things when it comes to doing seascapes. I've been doing them for three years. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a seasoned landscape photographer. So I'm not kind of thinking, oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. I've gone out and done some very specific things, which is, you know, doing the the long exposure or the say long exposure, we're talking half a second and one second because I love photographing right. crashing waves. So that's mainly what I've been doing. If I was a you know like a, a Thomas Heaton, a Nigel Danson, or whatever, who are you know big time into their landscapes, then yeah, there would be a limitation. But I don't feel that there is. I don't really. The only limitation, I guess, that you could say, and I'm sure we'll come to this, mm -hmm. is going to be the file quality when you file quality when you do really chimp those files and look at them and start to edit them and stuff that's when you notice stuff but it, yeah it's but i did a 72 inch print you know <laughs> so what can i exactly. say a, <sighs> exactly that, and that that's a that's something that i think is really important that people need to understand is you one of the things i love is that you still utilize and take advantage of the same software tools that you would with the photos that you took with your Sony camera. So what I mean by that is 
I've seen your your video. So for those, I'll drop a link. Actually, no, in the in the description of this video, there's a link to to Glenn's YouTube channel, and and it is a huge mistake if you're not subscribed already. So you should definitely do that. But one of the things I love is you have produced these videos where you showcase these workflows where you're blending multiple iPhone photos together, and I think that's a, a that is often a disconnect with a lot of photographers who are interested in using an iPhone where it's almost like they don't remember that you can easily take these raw files and, and we will talk about the, some of the limitations and the misnomers of raw on, on mm. iPhone, but like you blend wa waves from different exposures together, you apply treatments to them. Um, and that is a, a really powerful thing in my opinion that you don't just look at the iPhone as this toy camera. Like you go out there and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not like you go out there with the iPhone and, and you're like, all right, well, it's just my iPhone. So I don't really need to put a not lot of effort all. into this. No, not at all. I, I am, when I look at my, you know, two very different genres that I do, my main one being the portraits, I, I would say that I am equally happy with my portraits as I am equally happy with my seascapes because I know what the quality is for both genres. So I know that the portrait ones have got a different camera. I know I know all about what that should look like and what it does look like. Whereas the iPhone seascapes, I actually do feel, although I am going to be testing this uh, very soon anyway, starting to take out my Sony, but I'll explain something about that because I won't be taking as much kit. And that's purely because of what I've been doing with the phone. But the way that I use my iPhone to take seascapes, I, I get such a kick out of it. You know, I do, t I take it very seriously because I just love the results. And it, as daft as it might sound, when I'm editing the photographs that I've taken with my iPhone, the seascape ones, because it's, because it's kind of like a scene that I saw in front of me and I felt things, I heard things, I could smell things. I was really absorbed in that location. When I'm editing it, it sounds really corny to say this, but that's the only time ever really I can say that I've felt like an artist. And I hate that, that word. Even I get a, a shudder when I say that word because it doesn't seem to fit for me. Do you know what I mean? But sure. that when I am painting in these extra bits of like, you know, masking in certain waves to be in certain places, I think I, I just feel like it's my, my Bob Ross moment. Do you know what I mean? I just, I just love doing those extra little bits. I really do love it. And it's a very different feeling retouching the seascapes as it is to retouching a portrait. So what do you but mean I by enjoy that? both. In, well, I don't feel like an artist. I, I'm trying to kind of, how can I explain it other than saying it as simple as I am, I suppose. When I'm retouching a portrait, I'm not retouching something that I could see, smell, sound, everything. Do you know what I mean? It's like being in a landscape, in a seascape, it's an experience being there. And when I'm retouching it, it's almost like I'm painting it. Whereas when I'm retouching a portrait, I can relive the situation of when I was there and what we talked about and all this kind of stuff. And I retouched their faces to how they were when they were in front of me because then I wasn't analyzing their face. Do you know what I mean? There were things I didn't see when I was looking at them, but I see them when I'm looking at on the screen because I've got more time. It's a very different experience retouching that. It's there's not a there's not a there's not a feeling. There's just an, a, 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 a remembrance of what the situation was, if that makes sense. Whereas the, the seascapes is. God, I remember that. That wave was crashing. God, that was brilliant. And that's what I'm like when I'm thinking about it. It's almost like when I'm bringing those waves in, I can hear the waves crashing because it was such a good experience because I go out when they're really battering the shore and it's just like reliving it again because I get such a buzz being by the sea anyway. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, that's one of the things, even though I am also by the sea here in Florida, it is not the same. Uh, you know, you have these beautiful, like aggressive, jagged, rocky shores. We have yeah, the Jurassic Coast coastline. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. And I'm not knocking what we have, but on the Atlantic side of the of the U.S. on in Florida, at least, it's sandy beaches. So for me, there are only so many uh, photos I can take of a sandy beach with like a pier going out into the ocean. I just you know. You get them, and then for me, I'm kind of like I need more something more dynamic. Yeah, I need, yeah. I need something for the waves to crash into. But um, yeah. So, do you find 
with with the you know the fact that you are taking your phone to do these these seascape photos do you ever find yourself ask or telling yourself like oh man i wish i had my sony camera instead no i've not I'm not, i've never i've never felt like that because i've found that the results i've got i've been very very happy with but i've also kind of very aware that they are you know, a, a 2023 stroke, 2024 iPhone quality. So I, I kind of expect they're not to be the same as the Sony. So that that's kind of a side. But I've never found myself thinking, cool, I wish I did have my Sony here to do this. Because because it's too it would be too soon for me to feel like that. Because I just I would instantly remember the feeling of going out with the backpack. Do you know what I mean? And right. it's been nice to have that memory go and for me to literally just go, you know, most times. I mean, I've always got my tripod and the phone mount in the back of the car, always, okay. because I've got my phone always with me. So me and my wife could go out. We might go for dinner one evening down down to uh, Lyme Regis near towards beautiful coastline. And as we get there early, we might get there and I go, oh, look at the waves. Give me 10 minutes, straight to the car, tripod before we go in because we're early, take a few shots. And that's that's what I love about it as well. It's that convenience. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and I mean, is there a certain kit that you use with your iPhone? I know you mentioned the tripod and the tripod mount. Mm -hmm. So is that because you're going for um, a long exposure? Like I know we both use various uh, products, apps and, and physical products by Reflex. So what yeah, is yeah. that for you? Like, do you like, are you more into just au naturel? Like I'm just going with my iPhone and whatever app. Or are you kidding your phone with lenses or filters or stuff like that? Um, we've obviously got access to to lenses now, haven't we? With the the G series of lenses from Reflex, I have tried them, uh, and, and they're great. Don't get me wrong, but I've got to be honest with you, I'm still battling this thing of not wanting it to feel like it did when I went out with my Sony, when I was doing the Seascapes. And, and by that, I mean having all the kit. Now, it's wonderful having all that access to all this stuff. However, one of the things that I really love, which was the original you know, motivating factor of taking the phone out, was the portability of it. And what I don't want to do is to find myself being like it was with my Sony going, oh, right, okay, well, I'll put that lens on for this and I'll screw it on. And they go, oh, no, that's not working. Oh, I'll take that one off and put that one. I don't know if I prefer that. I don't want to be in that position. So for me at the moment, and this again, this, this is probably also going to be heavily reliant on the iOS, what we can do with iOS at the minute, what Apple allows us to do at the moment. Right. For, for my seascapes, there is no point in me using any filters. Zero point. Um, there's also no point in me using a lens for doing the seascapes that I'm using. I'm using the 1X lens, 24 mil, as it is, just straight out, naked iPhone, thank you very much. Because of the technology and what the limitations we have at the moment, there is no advantage to me using a lens for doing it, those particular kind of pictures, and there is definitely no advantage and no point to me using a filter. Now, when I say filter, I mean neutral density filter. Right. Circular polarizer, different story. Neutral density, okay. unless anybody out there can tell me otherwise, unless you're doing video with your iPhone, I fail to see any reason for using an ND. It, I, just, I just don't get it. I'm missing it. I, I just don't get it. No, you're hundred percent spot on. I, and I want to, I want to dive more into that, into the limitations currently with iOS and, and how we have to dance around all, all these weird restrictions. I want to get to that, but mm -hmm. I also want to touch on the idea of, uh, so when I, I was a guest on your lives, your weekly live stream several months ago, and we talked about Lightroom versus Lightroom classic. Mm -hmm. And it's just dawned on me. It's kind of funny. But uh, one of the comments I get in terms of people who 
are averse to Lightroom is they say, why can't Adobe just rebuild Lightroom Classic into Lightroom? <laughs> <laughs> and the same principle can be applied here. When I, I did a video also a few months ago with, um, where I showed people how I, I got the, this various, these various accessories from Polar Pro, um, mm -hmm. the, a case, um, a, a grip and a Bluetooth shutter yeah, yeah, a button. Yeah. And then I got the filter adapter and all the stuff and several people, um, messaged me and they're like, this completely goes, um, against like why this is, I might as well just use a camera because of all, exactly what you said. Oh, I need to, yeah. uh, you know, oh, this lens is not right. So I have to unscrew it. I have to pack it, get another one, put it on. And, you know, in, in, to some degree, I can see, um, I can see a lens being beneficial, uh, especially when you're pairing it with the one X you and I mm -hmm. both are kind of, we, we both know that it's unfortunate that, we can't pair the, the telephoto 2x with the, the 5x lens on the 15 pro max this is not something that is yeah. limited to reflex you know uh, pretty much every lens manufacturer um mm -hmm. does this but you know it for me the only way i would use uh, or where i really find a use for the lenses is it was with macro and actually, it's funny because someone earlier I saw there, oh, Stuart brought up saying here, Glenn should try macro. Um, I don't know. For me, it's it's fun, and but it's it's more of a novelty. Like I just don't do macro very often. It's more it's more of a novelty to see how close you can get to a subject. It, it, it's it's actually interesting that Stuart's there as well because I know me and Stuart have spoken about this. Is the fact that when someone like Stuart, who is, you know, incredible at doing his macro stuff, you know, you, he, I had him as, on as a guest and he, he talks about the fact that he takes a gazillion amounts of pictures of the same thing, but all at different focal planes with this setup. And that's all then blended together so that you get a better depth of field to what the ordinary out of camera, single shot macro shot would give you. Now, when it comes to the macro with the iPhone, you know, if we just use the built-in macro, um, then yes, it kind of zooms in, although it's not really a macro, but you don't get that depth of field look. So then you get on the lens from um, Reflex. You've got two different macros. You've got the 10X and you've got the long-range 10X. Um, now with those, you know, you, you can really, you can only really take a single shot macro. Right. So because of the way that the, the, the lenses are certainly made, and also with the limitations of iOS, you can only really take a single shot um, single shot macro. Now, I know, again, this is something me and Stuart talked about. We sort of said, well, maybe there's a chance if you had an app that would allow you to do like burst mode, let's say, something like Moment, you know, the Moment Cam app will allow you to hold down the shutter and get a burst of photos, and then you very slightly move forward. But I was kind of like, well, if you move slightly forward, then that changes the magnification, albeit only a small amount of the thing you're photographing. So how can you blend that together? So, you know, there are limitations in there. But, you know, but I've taken decent single shot macros with those lenses. Mm -hmm. You just have to be very careful because it's a very, very narrow field of focus. You've got to be very, 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 you know, take your time with it. But the results yeah. can be great. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we can go over we can also talk about the neutral density filters and the limitations there neutral density filters inherently are wonderful and and you know you see mm. i've got scott saying i find using an nd when doing long exposure uh and then use the reflex pro app to get say a 1 1 25th one to two second shot the thing is why wouldn't you just use the ev well, yeah, I mean, that's it, it, right. Exactly. Um, also, I don't, this drives me bonkers. And this goes, this is going towards one of the key limitations of iOS because you've got Apple here um, saying how this is a pro camera 
they had their in their their uh, iPhone event. They're showing these professional mm. photographers, you know, tethering and doing all these things. But then at the same time, we're limited to one second exposures. Um, you mm. could, you have. Can you tell people about your experiment that you did where you stacked like 14,000 stops of neutral density? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm exaggerating, yeah. but you stacked what, three neutral density filters? On no, no, iPhone? more, more than that. More. I had, in total, it worked out to 29 stops of neutral density. Um, so, and the thing with it is when, obviously if we make any changes to settings with any um, pro camera app, be it reflex, moment, um any of them then if the minute we start to change anything like shutter speed and iso then we drop from 48 megapixels down to 12. so my test was to see look i what i'd like to see could i possibly leave it in auto and put neutral density filters on now to, to bring the shutter speed down and yeah sure right. enough you know you put them on and it starts to slow down which is no different to using the ev slider because that doesn't change it from 48 to 12 megapixels anyway but I was putting them on, putting them on, putting them on. It got to the point where there were, I had, like I say, 29 stops of neutral density. I mean, it, it came out, the, the, you know, the, the phone like four inches easily deep of ND filters. But it, or it would not go any lower than one fifteenth of a second. It just, it just wouldn't do it. No, and it, and you know there was a time when bizarrely it dropped down to half a second, then one second, then bang, snapped back into one fifteenth of a second. It did the same with moment, so it was limited to one fifteenth of a second. It, it just it just wouldn't budge. So, so then I thought, well, what I'll do is I accept the fact that if I wanted to leave it in the highest possible resolution, you know, we're talking forty eight megapixel Apple Pro RAW then I've got to just leave it in auto and just use, you know, as it is, I can't take long exposure. Or I can only, the, the, the least I can do is go down to a 15th of a second. That's, that's the slowest I can possibly do. So I know that I've got to go down to 12 megapixels regardless. Now, could I do that? And this, this is the thing I wanted to test. When we, when we have these slow shutter apps, uh, long, long exposure apps like like Reflex that allows us to do a half a second. You can see the steps being made when each picture has tried to be blended together. So I thought, well, how about if I used the Pro Camera app? And yes, I'll adjust the shutter speed and use neutral density filters to try to get it to to hold that exposure. Just wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. The view you get is very juddery, and it, it's just not possible to do it. Um, so I kind of came away from that thinking, well, yeah, the, the, at the moment I see no point in using neutral density filters for taking photographs with the iPhone because you can, you can darken it down more using the EV slider, which doesn't take out the 48 megapixels. So why would you, why would you do it? Right. So then if you, let's say tomorrow you had a, a one hour conference call with, um, Tim Cook, and anything you recommended to him, he would implement in iOS oh. 18 and iPhone okay. 16. What would be the things, because I have here, you know, what, I have a question. What would you, what would need to happen in order for you to leave your Sony camera at home? Um, and, and obviously for Seascapes, that's already happening. I know you're going to be doing some tests and stuff, but maybe even with your portrait stuff. So what would you need to talk to Tim about in t that, that he would have to implement or get his, the, the, the engineers to implement I, I, on the hardware and software I've got side? Start. Yeah, we, we're talking a few years ahead before this would even be anywhere near possible, anywhere near. Um, there is no way that I would risk the time, effort, investment, all that stuff to go and take a portrait that's been planned and then do it with my iPhone. I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Um, but if, if there's things I could say to Tim Cook, could you just do this? That would help. Do you know what I mean? That would certainly help. It would be to say, look, just make every lens that's available 48 megapixel. You know, it's, 
There's no point pushing out saying it's 48 megapixel. And then you read the small print. Oh, only on one lens. Oh, Asterisk. only if I leave yeah. it in auto. Yeah, yeah, only if I leave it in auto. So there's there's obviously some technical wizardry that's not possible just yet to be able to do it, I guess, unless they're just holding something back. But to be able to adjust the shutter speed and ISO, even though it's not a real camera with a shutter, all that kind of stuff, to, and then that not to jump down from 48 megapixels to 12. Let's have a real 48 megapixel uh, uh, file. But also, let's have a proper RAW file. You know, there don't you give us your Apple Pro RAW, which isn't really RAW because it's got deep fusion being used on it to to reduce noise and stuff like that. And also, you know, it's been tone mapped, which we can alter afterwards, but we can't we can't remove the noise reduction. And that's just like, right. how is that a RAW? That's completely, it's a bit of a juxtaposition there. RAW, an Apple Pro RAW, no, no, it's not. It really isn't the same. It's very, it's very, very different. It's complete contrast there. Yeah, and, and the yeah. fact that the only way you can get 48 megapixels if, is if you use their kind of pre-cooked pro raw which is i think i think i think apple brian i think apple are getting very close to misusing the word pro just like the word legend Do you mean the word legend is overused nowadays isn't it when somebody does something that's kind of like just normal oh you legend it's like everyone's called a legend everything apple touch they're called pro well it's like well no it's not pro it, it, it isn't possibly pro right because you know you can't you can't alter things without it then dropping down. Now I'm not saying that 12 megapixels can't be considered pro. I'm not saying right. that because you know there are some amazing cameras out there. I've, I've, in fact, what's the FX3? What's that resolution for doing video? Is that 12 megapixels? I think it An is amazing an, camera. A7S the the A7S line yeah, has been yeah, 12 yeah. megapixels. Um, yeah, I but agree it's with kind you. Of, but you can you can change shutter speed and ISO and everything else with those. Right. Whereas the iPhone. If you do, then it's, you know, and pro raw well, isn't, isn't pro, it's not raw. So you, you, I have here, you know, going back to, to Stuart, cause this is something that I know I don't really, um, touch much. He's saying, has anyone tried a Samsung phone? Does Android have the same limitations as iOS? And, you know, I don't know. What I do know is that Samsung has been one of those manufacturers that really has been pushing camera capabilities. I will also say Sony has as well with their Xperia mm. line where they, they've partnered with Zeiss to, to, for the optics and they give much more, um, I would say pro quality or pro esque control. Like yeah. you're not jumping through these weird hoops. Um, and you know, I, I feel for the software, the iOS software developers, the third party developers like moment, like reflex, like, you know, um, uh, let's see here. Someone, oh, Norman brought up, you know, this, uh, camera pixels, uh, gives you focus yeah. bracketing. Yeah. So, but the thing is at the end of the day, all of these developers are still kind of, they're bound by the same limitations imposed by Apple on the mm -hmm. iPhone. Like it, it, they can do some kind of, you know, weird, like some kind of massaging, I think, within a certain degree. But you can't, if Apple says you're limited to one second, you're limited to one second. And then after that, you're going to yeah. do that, yeah. that frame blending. Um, yeah. So I just, Brian, can I just, can I just backtrack just a second? Yeah. That comment that you just brought up there from Norman, I think Norman was saying about camera, camera pixels, that was yeah, it saying it right they now. can do. Yeah, he, he's he's totally right that it does do focus bracketing. However, the limitations come when you, if you didn't want to have, if you wanted to have the true macro look, then you'd use a macro lens because obviously the iPhone doesn't give you that true macro look. But the trouble is when you put on a lens that's made for the iPhone and it's a macro lens, you, you that field of focus is just fixed. That's it. So right. even if the app can potentially focus in different points, it'll be focusing on a blurred part of that lens, if that makes sense. It so does. it isn't going to do that capture of, of all the different things with that look that the macro lens should give you. It's still going to be, you know, a single shot. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And uh, I just wanted to bring up also, so Scott is asking, has Glenn noticed using the 5X and a third-party app shooting raw 
in Adobe, you get a light band on the photo. Um, no. Uh, it's, it's a good question, and now you might want to check it, Scott. But I'll be honest with you, I've not... <sighs> Do you know, we, we, we wanted, I want a longer lens on my iPhone. And I could probably count on one hand how many times I've used it. Um, apart from when I've been doing like the testing recently. But general day to day, I've not found myself wanting to use it so much. And I don't know if it's just me, but the longer that focal length is, when you're just holding this very narrow piece of kit, any slight movement and the goes all over the place. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really does move a lot. So I've kind of found myself not really, not really using it. So, but I will check that, Scott. That's uh, something else for me to test. I'll put that on the list. Yeah. And <laughs> actually, I, there's more I want to talk about, but Glenn, I just want to test something. So right now, if I put you on and you go to screen yep. share, because I know you've got a really, I just want to see if that works. And if not, we're going to build a scene on the fly with everyone. And I'm just going to see if. Or, um, or, oh, actually, hold on a second. Chrome tab, window, entire screen. I'm just curious. No, I know this is... I'll tell you what I have got, though, because I know what I was going to share with you, Brian. It was pictures that I've taken with my iPhone and also to show some example differences between Pro Raw and what have you. How, the solution we've got is my website, I've got a dedicated iPhone portrait. I'm going to it now. Um, yeah, I've got that there. And also... They're very, very recent blog posts where I've done those comparisons. And you'll see you'll see that picture of the phone with all those ND filters on. There's a picture of my friend Ian that I photographed and did the same shot, the same lighting um, with the Sony. So if you just scroll, keep going down there. Uh, oh, oh, here. Right, ah, there you go. Of... Right. So this, this, yeah, this is the one here where I did the... Okay, so the lighting with this, I wanted to see, could I do a similar shot? Or where were we when it comes to the comparison of Sony and iPhone? And I went into this, let me just say, I went into this knowing, listen, you can't, I, I knew I wasn't going to go, wow, the, the iPhone is the same or it's better. I know we're not in that position, but I wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. But what you've got here, this is the this is the retouch pictures. On the left is the Sony file. On the right is the iPhone file. And you can see there, as it is, the iPhone file is standing up. It's standing up for itself. It doesn't look, doesn't look half bad. Right. But that is the finished picture. But if you scroll down, the lighting for this, by the way, that orange warm light on the right-hand side was actually a fire. It's a fire. It must be uh, an electric oh, yeah, heater. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Because, and then I've got a... Um, an LED light coming through that softbox on the left-hand side on the opposite side. So, you know, That's very easy to shoot, constant light with both the Sony, yeah, both the Sony and the iPhone. But as you scroll down, I'm thinking, well, you know, this is looking good. Um, and then you'll see, uh, oh, yeah, that's just talking about the light itself. Okay. And then if we continue down, eventually, so that's me doing it with the Sony tethered into a Capture One on the iPhone, on the iPad. Um, there you go, right. So I, what I did was, with the Sony, the shoot I did, I set it up with a 55 millimeter lens on it. That's what I was using, a 55 mil lens. Okay. So what I thought was, I've got to try and do a fair comparison. So I need to have the iPhone at a comparable focal length. Right. But I need it to be in the, in the highest possible quality. So it needs to be Apple Pro Raw at 48 megapixels. The only way I could get anywhere near 55 millimeters was to put the two times telephoto lens, that one there, on the 1X lens. So the 1X lens is 24 mil. I put that on, it's gonna give me the equivalent, as near as damn it, 48 millimeters. And that's that still keeps the phone at 48 megapixels, Apple Pro Raw, okay? So that's that was the reason for, for doing that there. So now if we scroll down, yep, you'll then start to see um yeah the result there's the settings there's my cat in the picture there see uh <laughs> scrolling down <laughs> you see what i take pictures of right so there you go that's the out of camera shots a uh, pre-editing side of things so on the left sony on the right iphone and at that magnification doesn't look bad at all not bad right. at all but now when you scroll down this oh, should yeah. show right that there that yep. there is the apple pro raw 48 megapixel file now i'm hoping people see this as it's coming through on the stream here but what you should see is that it just looks it actually looks out of focus yeah now i did do of... i did do tap focus i did all that 
Yep. In fact, no, I didn't do tap focus. I used the focus peaking so you could see where the focus peaking was going to be. But right. if you look at it, it is soft. And I was thinking, yes. what on earth is going on here? That is entirely down to Apple Pro Raw because of what it's doing to it. It's right. adding that noise reduction, which you can't take out. It's also tone mapping it, which you can alter. But look, I mean, look at the wood paneling behind. You know, yes. it, it almost looks... Well, it just looks like it looks waxy. You know, I mean, yes. that's the look it has. In fact, Ian, you can see Ian's lost detail in his hair, his sideburns yes. there. They're not so prominent. The, the The texture of his skin has gone. And that's Apple Pro Raw. So right. straight away, I was like, that's not good. If that's been touted as the Pro because it's Apple Pro Raw 48 megapixels, that's not good for doing portraits when you're, want, when you're considering, could I do them in a, in a more serious manner like this? However, there's obviously software we have available now. So I think if you scroll down, I think I've shown it here where I use the Topaz software. Yeah, Topaz uh, Sharpen. Yes. So, yep. and so now the Topaz Sharpen, yeah, big improvement, really big improvement. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we were able to zoom in on it, you'd see that it's, it's, it's actually made like round his ears and stuff like that. It's made it incredibly defined. It's too sharp because it's such right. minute detail. You know, his eyes, I wouldn't be able to retouch his eyes because those would have, have been really, really sharpened up to the point where Correct. if I did try to dive in there and edit them, they'd have been hard, you know? Right. Um, so so this was a test for me to see, look, could I get a comparable shot? And the answer's yes. If you scroll down again, I think you'll see the, the final retouch thing. But the answer's yes, I could, but it would... Um, Oh, there we it would go only there. be only be viewable for a social media picture to look comparable. Correct. If that makes sense. There we go. So this is the um, final retouch. Yeah. So if you did it like that and didn't zoom in, you'd go, "Wow, you know, which one, from here, which one's the Sony? Which one's the iPhone?" Right. You know, what I mean, it's kind of it's it's almost like that. Now I know which one's which because you know when you really do look at them, you can tell there's there's much more detail and and contour and contrast and everything, all that kind of stuff within the left-hand side one, which is the Sony one. But, you know, I've got to hand it to the iPhone one. At that magnification, when it's shared on the right platform, which stands up for itself, it really does. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I, to I remember seeing this, and I remember you sharing this with me. Um, and what I'm also going to really quickly, I want to drop the URL to that article right here in the chat. So if, uh, for those of you currently um, watching live and I'll drop it in the description afterwards, but this is a wonderful, wonderful article. Um, and we see here actually, so really quickly, I see David saying that the Apple skin tone is much pinker. So yeah. that is something I, yeah. I, this is why I don't photograph people because I'm red, green, colorblind. I'm glad Glenn, you are on here because if David said that, I would, I would be like, I, I don't maybe. And David's he's, also he's dead right. It really is. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. I mean, that's good to know, and it's good to see David here because David is is a local, and we've talked about photographing around here in the various uh, uh, wetlands preserves. But, um, so I guess I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I'm, I love that uh, you put you took the time to do. Mm. Um, a clinical comparison. It's not just like uh, based off of your gut instinct or, or like, you know, you, 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 you try to get as comparable of a focal length you try to make. And it was a, it was a controlled environment. That's the other big mm. thing is totally. That, yeah. 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 So the, the other thing, Brian, actually just yeah. on, on that note for, cause I'll, if I don't say now, I'll forget. But you know sure. what I mentioned about going out testing the neutral density filters using a pro camera app. And the one I used initially was Reflex. And then I did try it again with the moment one. But, you know, accepting, right, this is going to be a 12 megapixel file. So I, I, I then adjust the shutter speed and I take it down to, let's say, one second or, or yeah, one second or even half a second. No, one second. And then because it's obviously overexposed, I then start to stack those ND filters on. And when it gets to the point that it starts to be, you know, in the correct exposure with a stack full of ND filters on it, what I found was 
even though I'd set it to be one second, the shutter speed would then start to, you can't hold it there. It would start, it, you'd see it wobbling around. So Correct. you couldn't go out and say, do you know what? I'm going to take a half a second exposure or one second exposure here. I'll do that, blah, blah, blah. Put the NDs on. Right, that's it, locked in. And I'll start taking them. It ain't going to be locked in because right. it just it just has a mind of its own, As especially when you're doing seascapes because you've got the white of the the white horses as they come in on the waves. That changes the exposed, the light in the scene. So then the shutter speed moves a bit more. It's like, ah, oh. so you can't lock it like I can do with my with my sony if i had my sony out with me which i will be doing um differently than before uh or like when you're doing using the prop you might you might as well just use the long exposure apps which work incredibly well they do work incredibly well i just wish that there was a way because obviously the 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 shorter this sounds weird the shorter the long exposure so if you're doing like, uh, you know, like with re, uh, re-expose, you can take it to half a second. The shorter that length is, the more obvious what's going Correct. on, the way it's trying to knit the pictures together. There must be a way, there must be a way within the software that you can create it so that it then smooths that out, that it removes right. that stepping. There must be, you know, there, there, there has to be a way to do that. I I... I agree with you. And this is where I, I kind of question, I mentioned earlier how like the, you know, the limitations that third party app developers have um, kind of being bound by Apple's own APIs and, and what they choose to give access to. But, you know, I see here, for example, Richard's asking anyone use Halide 2 um, or the, is the iPhone camera just as good? Specifically about Halide, one of the things that I'm curious about, and I don't know if you know, Glenn, the answer, but we know that Halide and Moment and uh, Reflex, they have the ability, yes, to shoot Pro Raw. They can tap into Pro Raw. But as you said, they, there's also Raw, which knocks you down. The, the downside is it knocks you down to 12 meg- megapixels. The upside is it gives you the pure sensor data. Um, where you can do, for example, noise reduction in Lightroom. But what I'm curious about is, so every major photo editing app that does raw processing has its own uh, raw engine. Like it has its own, like Adobe has its own uh, raw processing. On One does, Skylum does. And so what I'm curious is, how does it work with the third party apps where are they just simply when you engage raw, is it just saving the pixel in the sensor information or is it being run through their own special sauce, so to speak? Um, and that, I don't know. Mm. That's something I'm trying to figure out. Um, Mm -hmm. but I do know, I do know that obviously when you, when you shoot in pro raw, because I know that Adobe and Apple work quite close on it because it happens so very quickly that when, when they introduced Pro Raw, that profile was also in in Lightroom. Do you know what I mean? If you if you put a Pro Raw four into Lightroom, you'll right. see that the profile says Apple Pro Raw, and you can change it. But if you use one of these Pro Camera apps and you take it down to, and this is what I like about the Pro Camera apps. Certainly, I mean, in in um, moments, it's very clear. In Reflex, it's very clear that you can tap to come out of Pro Raw, so you're going to have a twenty a twelve megapixel. Bayer raw file, a DNG Correct. raw file. And when you when you put that into Lightroom, you then have what you would expect to see in the profiles, Adobe Color, Adobe Neutral, all those ones. You know what I mean? Like you would do if I put my Sony in there and so forth. So right. if that's anything to go by, that would suggest that there is no manipulation done on it. And it is, it is a true, for want of a better word, true raw file. It um, is. It but absolutely I'm, is. I'm, uh, yeah. So that that... That, that's actually what I would recommend people use, De- depending on subject matter. Do you know what I mean? Certainly don't use, in from my experience so far, having tested this in a very controlled, serious environment in the studio with you know lighting done correctly and all that kind of stuff, I would say do not use Apple Pro Raw. Whack it into a 12 megapixel DNG Bayer Raw file and don't be put off by the fact that it's 12 megapixels because you saw it on that blog post there i printed a 72 inch 
iPhone 12 megapixel Bayer RAW file, and it was outstanding. Correct. Absolutely outstanding. No, and we're not talking about viewing distance here, like a movie poster when you stand about 10 foot away from it, it looks good, but the closer you get, it's like, ooh, no, now it's breaking down. This was when we, me and my friend Ian were putting it on the studio wall, his studio wall. It was like, look at the quality of that. Can't believe that's off an iPhone. So yeah. it's a very it's a very good 12 megapixel file. Yeah, there's a photo in that article, uh, to your blog post that I linked in the chat. There's a photo. There was a photo of the two of you standing by it, by the giant print. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And you see, uh, my buddy Ron here is saying he thinks the the iPhone main camera is only 12 megapixels. The 48 megapixels part of Raw, Pro Raw Magic. Yeah, it's 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 there's a, I forget, is it pixel binning? It, it basically pro raw is doing, uh, it, it's converting each pixel into four pixels, something like that. Um, but it's not a true, like 40, as far as I know, it's not a true 48 megapixel, uh, sensor. So, and I could be wrong, but it, there's definitely something this, where this, this is where the confusion comes in because I did so much reading about this uh before i did a, a recent iphone conference and I, I read so much about it and again i mean your, your buddy there might might you know i could be standing to be corrected here but from what i read on apple documentation it was saying that it is a 48 megapixel file this thing about the four pixels being blended together was all to do with making it was all to do with giving the exposure correction it was all this it was all to do with manipulating the actual image but i was under under the impression that it was a 48 megapixel file. But there's it, it is so confusing. Do you know what I mean? There's yes. nothing that says that is that and that is that. It's all very, you know, takes you around the houses when you read stuff and you come away feeling more confused than when you first started reading. Absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing when they launched the 15 and the pro and they're like, oh, it's got seven lenses. And it's like, no, it doesn't exactly have seven lenses. You know, don't, mm. don't, that, that was a bit of a, 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 a unfortunate marketing spin. It's just cropping in, you know, the, that sensor, but I, I, I'm, I, despite all of this stuff, I feel like every iteration of iOS and, and the iPhone pushes us further and further, um, to, I mean, simply by the, just by physics, it's, we will never be able to fully replicate optically what you can do with a full frame sensor, this giant sensor and a, a lens with multiple, uh, uh, you know, lens elements or glass elements put throughout just simply a matter of physics. However, computational photography and AI and stuff like that, if you're interested in that, that will help you like, like a portrait mode and that kind of stuff. Um, it'll help you simulate a shallow, uh, plane of focus, for example. But if you're the kind of person who, like you and I, really enjoy ha having the 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 raw ingredients and editing the photo as we see fit, we're still we're still a ways off, um, and that's okay. Uh, I love that how en enthusiastic you are about mobile and what you're doing to to not pretend like it's you know, we're, we're good to go. Like we can just leave. No, know, not so we're not, we're yeah. not there. We're not there. Yeah. But, it, but just, it's great fun. You know, if you just accept it for what it is, if you kind of forget all the spin and all the, all these kind of promises of it's this, it's that and say, all right, okay. Say that, but I know what I, I know what I think about it. Then just enjoy it for what it is. The quality is fantastic. The convenience is fantastic. The results you can get are really, really good. Just don't expect it to be pro. Don't expect it to be comparable when you really zoom in and start to chimp on it to be what your whatever brand of camera you're using. It's not, it's not up there. It's it's a great, great product to produce great photography for sharing on a, an appropriate platform like social media. Right. You can get some great prints done. But you know, maybe, maybe it's us who are photographers that are the most critical about it. Everybody else is really, really happy. My wife loves the pictures that comes out of her iPhone. She's not there chimping, giving it, oh, that looks a bit grainy or that looks a bit contrasty. She couldn't care less. It's like, that looks great on my phone. That's right. all she's bothered about. Right. Um, and the fact that- I think, just, I think people don't need to promise us too much too soon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
I think uh, on that, it's that's the perfect way to end it. It's it's um, well, <laughs> so Richard just came up. <laughs> just I, I said the perfect way to end it. Richard's asking, so so not you should we not use Pro Raw? I mean, I don't think you should. I really don't think you should, Richard. Do you know what I mean? It, depending on if you're looking, if you're somebody who's going to edit his pictures, I wouldn't use Pro Raw because you're going to find you're going to you're going to zoom in like you did on that portrait of mine and go, oh, it looks out of focus. Oh, you won't have that if you just shoot at the 12 megapixel Bayer Raw DNG file. You won't have that to worry about. Yeah, I mean, um, and, yeah, I don't know. For me. I want to have control over things like noise reduction and sharpening and sure Apple applies noise reduction as part of the, the photonics engine that ProRaw uses, but I have no control. And in some cases it can mm. lead to these overly soft details. So if you were to take a ProRaw file in Lightroom and you right mm. click and you go to enhance, you will see an exclamation point in a triangle saying yeah. you can't do this. You That's tap right. and you go to raw and you get the bear raw, like Glenn is saying, all all day long. Go ahead and do your noise reduction using Lightroom's AI. Um, mm. And like you said, oh, go ahead. To, to answer, to go back and answer very quickly that one question, what would I ask Tim Cook to do? Yeah. Just allow us to turn on or turn off the noise reduction in the Pro Raw. That would be a good starter. I like it. That's a good one, actually. Because, yeah, I mean... I don't know. For me, I, I, more important for me is, is exposure bracketing. And that's just not, also, that's not something that can be easily done. Um, like pro raw does the tone mapping for you. And I want to be able to tone map myself. I actually prefer Lightroom's HDR functionality. Um, and the funny thing is like apps like moment has a built in auto exposure bracketing function, but in, in all, I don't understand if it's a moment thing or if it's an iOS limitation, but it brackets by ISO. So uh, you get, right. yeah, you get three exposures. They are like minus two, zero, plus two, but do not look at those images because they are riddled with noise They because they're bracketed by exposure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, Glenn, I am, I'm so grateful that you shared your time and, and your experiences using the iPhone. I love that, you know, we're, you're a brother in arms with me as we, you know, do push still to the, the, the mobile photography space forward in our own ways. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, you know, where, where can people find you? I mean, I know they can find you right there at the URL, but <laughs> is there, what, what, what would you like people to know about you? Like, what, you know, is there something you're working on or you want people to check out? Um, do you know what? Everything that I'm kind of working on, um, they'll find out certainly on that website there, glenjuice.com. I am quite active on that with the blog posts. Um, but my social media is very easy to follow. It's just at glenjuice.com. Um, but the, I've got a newsletter, which I'm, I'm loving putting together my newsletter because I write articles for that. And it's all very, it's all very kind of, um, structured. It actually is like getting a newspaper twice a month, you know, what I mean, with all these different articles in it, which I think are relevant and anything that kind of crops up in the industry, I'll kind of drop that in as well, that you might want to know about this just in case you didn't. So those are the places I'd say, have a look at obviously the YouTube channel as well, mate. So, yeah. Excellent. Well. Glenn, again, uh, thank you so much. And, and I want to thank everyone who's watched live, everyone who watches on, on replay and leaves comments and stuff. Um, if you've got questions for Glenn and we didn't get to it, leave them in the comments. I, I speak with Glenn almost every single day, so it, I can tell him like, hey, check this out. Um, but with that, uh, be sure to subscribe to Glenn's channel. Again, the link to his channel is in the description. And I'm going to drop a link to the blog post that we referenced here. Glenn, thank you so much. Thank you, mate. I've enjoyed it. Doesn't it go quick? I, I, now I know I, what my guests feel like now. And it doesn't feel like <laughs> it. And I, I, I mean, I suspect I'm looking, I have the, 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 the watch counter here and there, it's actually going up. More people are joining. So it's kind of great. Um, um, so well, that, yeah. I, uh, we're four minutes past my bedtime. I've got time to go and get my egg whites, keep these guns going. We're happy there you days. Go. There you go. Don't, don't, we can't have we can't have you grumpy. So we need to get, make sure we get our solid eight hours. All Good right, my thank friend. you for inviting me on, mate. Uh, anytime.
Cheers, everyone.